Now let's turn to foreign affairs, and I'm delighted to be joined again by John Mearsheimer, who is a professor of international relations, um, and he is based at the University of Chicago, uh, and he's also been, I think it's fair to say, John, you've been quite controversial this year. Uh, I know you (laughs) might disagree with that label, but you've been quite controversial this year and last um, in your uh, arguments on Ukraine, Russia, um, and now, as we will talk about in a bit, on uh, Gaza. Um, but let's start with the news, uh, if we may, about Ukraine, because Zelensky was in Washington uh, last night um, pleading for uh, a $60 billion aid package, which it looks as though is not going to be forthcoming. Um, but President Joe Biden has reiterated his support for Ukraine. Um are we at a stage now where American support for the Ukraine is starting to ebb, not just among some Republicans, as people always like to say, but among Democrats and the political class? I think there's no question about that. I think that uh, uh, up until uh, the late summer, uh, most uh, of the foreign policy establishment, most people in the foreign policy establishment in the United States thought there was a good chance that uh, Ukraine could win the war, actually defeat the Russians inside of Ukraine. I think it's now clear that that's not the case. I think it's clear to almost everybody that the balance of power has shifted in a marked way in the Russians' favor. And independent of this aid package, uh, the Russians are on the march. And there's all sorts of reasons to think that the Ukrainians are going to have a very difficult time stemming the tide. Uh, So I think this overall pessimism, independent of the aid package, uh, has contributed to the pessimism here in the United States and the unwillingness of people to fork out huge amounts of money to Ukraine. Would you then argue uh, that uh, essentially the Western push to help Ukraine has been futile? I think there's no question. Uh, I've argued for a long time that we are leading Ukraine down the primrose path. Uh, I think that pushing to bring Ukraine into NATO was a huge mistake. And uh, Putin made it clear when we announced in April 2008 that we were going to pursue that policy, that he would destroy Ukraine before he would let that happen. And in fact, that is what happened, is happening. Uh, Ukraine has already lost the a substantial portion of its territory, and I believe we'll lose more, and it will end up as a dysfunctional rump state. Uh, So this is a disaster for Ukraine. I believe if we hadn't pushed forward to bring Ukraine into NATO, that Ukraine would probably be intact today. There would be no war. Uh, And I even believe Ukraine would still continue to uh, control Crimea. But uh, the war hasn't gone... uh brilliantly for Vladimir Putin. I think that's fair to say. Um, uh, You know, if there had been a peace in February, March 2022, uh, do you think Putin would have had a stronger hand then or a weaker hand then? Putin did not want this war. He went to great lengths before February 24th, 2022, uh, when the war started, to uh, head it off at the past. He wanted to come up with a diplomatic solution. And then shortly after the war broke out in February, uh, he was negotiating with the Ukrainians uh, to work out a deal. Uh, And at that point in time, he was not talking about uh, incorporating any uh, Ukrainian territory, uh, save for Crimea, which had already been annexed, uh, into uh, Russia. And all he really cared about, it's quite clear from all the reports of the people who were involved in the discussions, was NATO expansion into Ukraine. He wanted a neutral Ukraine. And if he had gotten a neutral Ukraine, this is right after the war started, I believe there's a good chance the war could have been shut down. But it was the Americans and the British who moved in and basically told Zelensky that he had to walk away from the negotiations because we believed that we could win the war. We meaning Ukraine plus the West. Uh, And in 2022, it actually looked like that might be the case. But now it's quite clear that 2023 has been a disastrous year for the Ukrainians. And if anything, the Russians will win the war. 
Did you ever think uh, then, it, you said it, it looked as though Ukraine might be able to win the war. Did you ever think or did you ever say that you thought that Ukraine might be able to win the war in 2022? No, I didn't think that uh, Ukraine would ever win the war. Uh, I think it was just a question of when uh, Putin decided to mobilize Russia and get serious about fighting the war. The fact is that he uh, invaded Ukraine with a very small force. Uh, I argue that he had at the most 190,000 troops. Uh, there are a number of smart people who pay very careful attention to what happened uh, during the invasion who argue that he had uh, at the most 100,000 troops. But this was a small military force. And of course, he ran into real resistance, or the Russians ran into real resistance inside of Ukraine uh, because the Ukrainian army had been trained and armed by the West. This was a quite formidable fighting force. So the Ukrainians stymied the, uh, uh, the Russians, but it was all a matter of when the Russians would respond uh, to this stalemate uh, that developed in the summer of 2022 and mobilize uh, many more troops than Ukraine could mobilize. And in fact, in late September, uh, the Russians mobilized 300,000 troops. And then over the course of 2023, that's this year, uh, roughly 420,000 men have joined uh, the Russian army. So the Russian army is growing bigger and bigger. And at the same time, the Ukrainian army is suffering enormous casualties. And it had a much smaller manpower pool to draw from to begin with. So in 2022, when the Russians hadn't fully mobilized, it looked like Ukraine might win. But uh, uh, if you factored in mobilization on the Russian side, that was not a realistic belief. Are you not, um, uh, and forgive me if this is impertinent, are you not um, slightly underplaying uh, the extent of the Russian invasion um, at the beginning of the war? I mean, they did menace Kiev. Um, it did look very much as though they were intending to take Kiev. Do you think that was just a bluff? I don't think they could have taken Kiev if they wanted. They just didn't have enough troops. Kiev is a city that has roughly 3 million people. Uh, you know, they had tens of thousands of troops, the Russians did, uh, in the Kiev area. There's no way they were going to quickly take that. It's quite clear that what the Russians were interested in doing, or to put it more specifically, what Putin was interested in doing was coercing the Ukrainians into coming to the negotiating table and cutting a deal on Ukraine joining NATO. He was not interested in conquering Ukraine or conquering the rest of Ukraine. As I like to say, it's the conventional wisdom in the West that Putin was bent uh, on conquering all of Ukraine and making it part of a greater Russia. Uh, there is no way that he could have done this with 190,000 troops if he was interested in doing that. Again, as I often point out, when the Germans invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, they went in with you know more than a million troops. Uh, he would have needed an army that was far bigger uh, than the one that went into Ukraine in February 2022 if he was bent on conquering the country and incorporating it into Russia. Uh, and he was not. Well, uh, let's move on to uh, another controversial subject that you've uh, written about this year, um, and that is uh, the war in Gaza. Uh, and on your substack, uh, you have a very uh, powerfully written piece called Death and Destruction in Gaza, um, which says you want to be on the right side of history uh, because you believe Israel is pers purposefully massacring a huge number of civilians. Um, and you think uh, essentially it's a, a, an attempted genocide. Um, almost. Uh, that's quite strong language, is it not? Well, I want to be clear. I did not say it's an attempt to genocide. In fact, I've said publicly on a number of occasions, I do not believe that the Israelis are pursuing a genocide here. Uh, a very prominent Israeli-born scholar of the Holocaust uh, has said that he believes the Israelis have genocidal intent uh, and he makes it clear he's not arguing that they're executing a genocide. 
I do believe that what the Israelis are doing in terms of murdering huge numbers of innocent civilians in Palestine or in Gaza, Palestinians in Gaza, is a war crime. I think there's no question about that. Uh, and that's what I was criticizing the Israelis for. But I was not criticizing them for genocide. No, you're quite right. Forgive me for that. I've, I've misquoted you. But uh, I mean, one thing you do point to a lot in your piece is the um, very violent statements of senior Israeli commanders, and they are quite shocking, some of them. Um, but I mean, I suppose the point is they have just had a terrorist attack. Uh, and, you know, if you look back at 9-11, you know, quite senior Americans said some pretty shocking things in the days after that. Uh, are we not reading too much into uh, emotional words? I think if you look at the language, the uh... Israeli elite is using. And we're not talking about a few extremists in the population. We're talking about people in the cabinet. We're talking about active duty generals, retired generals. If you look at the language that they're using uh, to describe the Palestinians uh, and to say or describe what they want to do in Gaza, it's truly shocking. Uh, and the this language is what leads Omar Bartov uh, who is the Holocaust scholar I was talking about a minute ago, to say that it looks like there is genocidal intent on the part of the Israelis. And Bartov, by the way, is not the only person making this argument. Other people, other scholars of uh, of the Holocaust and, and of genocide are making the same point. And again, I want to be very clear here. The argument is not that the Israelis are executing a genocide at this point in time. That's not the argument. But there is clear evidence that they are committing war crimes by murdering huge numbers of Palestinian civilians and doing other things as well, like starving the population inside of Gaza. But uh, uh, you would not expect this from the Israelis, given the Holocaust, given the horrors that were inflicted on Jews in Europe uh, between 1939 and 1945. You would not expect Israeli leaders to be talking about the Palestinians in this way and talking about doing to Gaza uh, what some of the leaders are, are talking about doing. Um, I suppose an obvious question is, what else do you expect Israel to do about Hamas? Because uh, they, clearly they've had a huge security failure um, and uh, Hamas is an intractable problem for Israel. And I think neighboring Arab states acknowledge that, um, that Hamas is a, is a violent cult. It is a terrorist organization. It is hell bent on uh, killing as many Israelis and Jews as possible. Um, how do we expect Israel to deal with that problem? Well, there's no question that Israel has the right uh, to retaliate against Hamas. It's completely understandable that the Israelis are bent on eliminating uh, Hamas uh, in Gaza. One can understand that. But there's a difference between going after Hamas and punishing on purpose the civilian population. Those two different things. If you go after Hamas, if you're the Israelis and you go after Hamas, there is going to be a significant amount of collateral damage, which is to say a lot of civilians are going to be killed. That's inevitable. And it's in large part because Hamas is woven into the civilian population. But the Israelis are not simply going after Hamas. What the Israelis are doing is they are purposely killing huge numbers of civilians. And the evidence for this is overwhelming. And the evidence comes from inside Israel itself. If you look at the statements that Israeli leaders are making, and if you look at the assessments of the bombing campaign that are coming from inside Israel and are well done assessments, it's quite clear that this is a classic punishment campaign where the aim is to kill large numbers of civilians. And I believe, and there is a good amount of evidence to support this, that what the Israelis are interested in doing in the end is ethnically cleansing Gaza. Uh, I believe the Israelis would like to ethnically cleanse Gaza, and they would like to ethnically cleanse the West Bank. They'd like to get rid of the Palestinians uh, from those two areas. Very important to understand, Freddie 
that if you look at greater Israel, which includes Gaza, the West Bank, and what is generally referred to as Green Line Israel, Israel before 1967, in those three areas that comprise greater Israel, there are approximately 7.3 million Jews and 7.3 million Palestinians. For Israel, this is an intolerable situation. You certainly can't have a democracy when you have those kind of numbers because it soon will cease to be, Israel will soon cease to be a Jewish state. So what the Israelis would like to do, or many Israelis would like to do, certainly many Israelis in the present government, is they'd like to ethnically cleanse Gaza and they'd like to ethnically cleanse the West Bank. And there's all sorts of evidence to support this. Uh, so how do you achieve that end? One way to do it is inflict massive punishment on the civilian population to directly go after the civilian population. And that's what the Israelis are doing. That's not to deny that they're not also going after Hamas, but this is not a military operation that is specifically designed to get Hamas and nothing else. Joe Biden has been uh, quite clear in his support of Israel and America um, generally tends to be very supportive of Israel. You, of course, wrote uh, a famous book, the, the Israel Lobby with Stephen Walt, um, about the pressure that Israel exerts on Washington to uh, pursue policies that suit Israel. Um, a lot of people called you anti-Semitic for that, and a lot of people will call you anti-Semitic for your arguments now. How do you respond to that? Do you think that's hysterical? I think, Freddie, you can define anti-Semitic any way you want. And what's happened here is we have reached a point where anybody who criticizes Israel in a serious way is described as an anti-Semite. Uh, I have a number of friends who are Jewish, uh, who are very Jewish, and who are anti-Zionists. They don't believe in the Zionist enterprise. They're basically internationalists at heart. According to most defenders of Israel, they are anti-Semites. I think it's ludicrous to call them anti-Semites. They're not anti-Semites. You can argue that they're misguided. And you can argue that someone like me is unfair in criticizing Israel, that I'm too harsh in my criticism. I don't think that's true, but you can make that argument. But labeling me an anti-Semite or labeling someone who's an anti-Zionist and is, as an anti-Semite is, I think, stretching the definition of anti-Semitism to the point where it becomes almost meaningless. I mean, I do believe there is real anti-Semitism in the world, and I condemn it. I think it's absolutely horrible. I think what happened in Europe for centuries is disgraceful. Uh, so I'm all in favor of condemning anti-Semitism as long as it has some reasonable definition. But when anti-Semitism is stretched to the point where people like me uh, are criticized uh, as uh, you know, one of the world's lead for being one of the world's leading anti-Semites. I, I think you know we're, uh, we're we're making arguments that just don't make sense, or we're making charges that just don't make sense. Do you think that perhaps there is a bias uh, among the United Nations and uh, in the European Union, perhaps, uh, and certainly international aid agencies? There's a bias against Israel, and there's a tendency to uh, push information to push statistics uh, that are then disputed. Do you think there's a, a weight of international opinion that goes against Israel? Or would you say actually it's the other way around? It all depends. If you're talking about the European Union, or you're talking about Europe. I mean, I think the Europeans basically back Israel uh, to the hilt. Uh, I mean, if you look at the Germans and you look at Britain, I mean, there's no evidence that uh, the British government or the British elites or the German government or the German elites are siding with the Palestinians against Israel. Uh, there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference between how most Europeans uh, react to what's going on uh, in Gaza. Uh, th there's not much difference between that and what the Americans are doing, the way I see it. Uh, once you get outside of Europe uh, and the United States, to put it in slightly different terms, once you get outside of the West, there is no question that there is a huge amount of criticism of Israel uh, for what it's doing to the Palestinians. And, you know, you talk about aid agencies, 
it's not so much the aid agencies, it's the human rights group. I mean, groups. You want to remember that uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and B'Tselem, which is the leading human rights group inside of Israel itself, those three organizations, which have stellar reputations from a human rights perspective, in my opinion, have all produced lengthy reports that describe Israel as an apartheid state and say that is a crime against humanity. Uh, and you can rest assured that when all the dust settles and these human rights organizations uh, look at what the Israelis have done uh, in Gaza, they will accuse the Israelis of war crimes, justifiably so. So, you know, there is no question that there is this body of organizations in various countries around the world that are highly critical of Israel. And there are people in the West who are highly critical of Israel. And many of them, by the way, Freddie, are Jewish. Uh, it's very important to understand that it's a, this is not a case where all Jews are uh, supporting what Israel is doing in Gaza. And in fact, some of the most significant resistance inside of the United States uh, to what Israel is doing is coming from uh, Jewish individuals and Jewish organizations like uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and Not In My Name. Uh, so this is an actually quite complicated situation. Uh, and it's not like it's all the world against Israel or everybody but the United States against Israel. It, it just doesn't look like that at all when you begin to sort of peel away the layers of the onion. John Mearsheimer, uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you very much for coming on to Spectator TV and thank you for all your appearances this year. Uh, I wish you a very happy Christmas and uh, I'm sure everyone We'll hope for a more peaceful new year.